think it's very important to distinguish between facts, opinions, and beliefs. So I'm going to try very hard to be crystal clear when I'm presenting facts versus stating opinion or communicating my beliefs. So let me be right up front about this. I hold three beliefs, which I'm going to share with you, and then spend the rest of our time showing you how I got to these beliefs. The first is that the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. And why is this important? Because we tend to base our view of the future on our most recent experience. That's just part of being a human. It's also a gigantic liability at key turning points. So I say that massive change is already upon us. When I first gave this material as a talk three years ago, I used to say massive change is coming. Well, it's here now. That much is completely obvious. And the belief I hold is that it's really just getting underway. And I'm going to show you why I believe that. Next, I believe that it is possible, possible that the pace and or scope of change could overwhelm the ability of our key social and support institutions to adapt. Katrina taught us that a major U.S. city could be wiped out and pretty much remain that way for years. That is an example of major change occurring faster than our ability as a nation to respond. The types of changes I foresee in our economic landscape are much larger than Katrina. My third belief is that we do not lack any technology or understanding necessary to build ourselves a better future. Rather, we only lack the political will, which is really a reflection of the fact that we the people have not yet raised our voices in unison for real, substantive change. So the good news is that we already have everything we need, and the bad news is that we might not deploy it fast enough. Remember, these are simply my beliefs right now, and I reserve the right to change them if new information suggests that they are wrong. So what do I mean when I say massive change is upon us? Well, here is where we need to burrow into the three E's, which is where we'll spend the rest of our time in the crash course. The first E is the economy, which is the lens through which the crash course looks at everything. Within the economy, there are four primary areas of concern. Exponential money, the first ever collapse of a global credit binge, an aging population, and the national failure to save. If it isn't clear to you what these mean, don't worry. We'll be discussing each of these in detail. The next E is energy, and there we will discuss what peak oil implies for an economic system that is based on continual expansion. This topic is important enough that I should dedicate the entire crash course to it, but I can't and I won't. And finally, the third E, the environment, will be exerting its own unknowable but certainly significant economic burdens due to shrinking resources and other systemic pressures at the same time that the other two E's will be clamoring for your money and attention. The story that I'm going to weave for you cuts across all three E's and will make the claim that our monetary system is badly out of step with reality and will suffer severe instability and possibly collapse as a result. It is fair to say that this particular constellation of issues, problems if you will, has never been faced before at these levels. Never. Whether you find this terrifying or exhilarating is simply a matter of your mindset. One key towards easing your mind is being armed with accurate and detailed information. This is what the crash course will deliver. When viewed individually, each one of these sub-areas on each one of these E's could entirely consume your entire attention. But I'm going to make the claim that these problems are so intertwined that they cannot be solved in isolation. All three E's need to be considered at the same time. How are they linked? By something very powerful that we desperately need to understand a lot better. In the crash course, we will learn a few foundational key concepts. None are more important than exponential growth. Understanding this will greatly enhance our chances to form a better future. Here's a classic chart displaying exponential growth, a chart pattern that is often called a hockey stick. We are charting an amount of something over time. The only requirement for a graph to end up looking like this is that the thing being measured grows by some percentage over each increment of time. The slower the percentage rate of growth, the greater the length of time we need to chart in order to visually see this hockey stick shape. Another thing I want you to take away from this chart is that once an exponential function turns the corner, even though the percentage rate of growth might remain constant, and possibly quite low, the amounts do not. They pile up faster and faster. In this particular case, you are looking at a chart of something that historically grew at less than 1% per year. It is world population, and because it is only growing at roughly 1% per year, we need to look at several thousands of years to detect this hockey stick shape. 
The green is history, and the red is the most recent UN projection of population growth for just the next 42 years. Certainly by now, math-minded folks might be getting a little uncomfortable because they might feel I'm not presenting this information in a classical or even very accurate way. Where mathematicians have been trained to define exponential growth in terms of the rate of change, we are going to focus on the amount of change. Both are valid, it's just that one way is easier to express as a formula, and the other way is easier for most people to intuitively grasp. Unlike the rate of change, the amount of change is not constant. It grows larger and larger with every passing unit of time, and that's why it's more important for us to appreciate than the rate. This is such an important concept that I will dedicate the next chapter to illustrating it. Also, mathematicians would say that there's no turn the corner stage of an exponential chart, because this is just an artifact of where we draw the left hand scale. That is, an exponential chart can nearly always look like a hockey stick at every moment in time as long as we adjust the left axis properly. But if we know the limits or boundaries of what we are measuring, then we can fix the left axis and the turn the corner stage is absolutely real and vitally important. For example, the total carrying capacity of the Earth for humans is thought to be somewhere in this zone, give or take a few billion. Because of this, the turn the corner stage is very real and not an artifact of graphical trickery. The critical takeaway for exponential functions, the one thing I want you to recall, relates to the concept of speeding up. You can think of the key feature of exponential growth either as the amount that is added growing larger over each additional unit of time, or you can think of it as the time shrinking between each additional unit of amount added. Either way, the theme is speeding up. To illustrate this using population, if we started with 1 million people and set the growth rate to a measly 1% per year, we'd find that it would take 694 years before we achieved a billion people. But we'd be at 2 billion people after only 100 more years, while a third billion would require just 41 more years, then 29 years, then 22, and then finally only 18 years to add another to bring us to 6 billion people. That is, each additional billion people took a shorter and shorter amount of time to achieve. Here we can see the theme of speeding up. This next chart is of oil consumption, perhaps the most important resource of them all, which has been growing at the much faster rate of nearly 3% per year, so we can detect the hockey stick shape over the course of just 150 years. And here too, we can fix the left axis with some precision because we know with reasonable accuracy how much oil the world can maximally produce. So again, having turned the corner is an extremely relevant and important event to us. And here's the US money supply, which has been compounding at incredible rates ranging between 5 and 18 percent per year. So this chart only needs to be a few decades long to see this hockey stick effect. And here's worldwide water use, species extinction, fisheries exploited, and forest cover lost. Each one of these is a finite resource, as are many other critical resources, and quite a few are approaching their limits. And here is the world you live in. If it seems like the pace of change is speeding up, well, that's because it is. You happen to live at a time when humans will finally have to confront the fact that our exponential money system and resource use will encounter hard physical limits. And behind all of this, driving every bit of every graph, is the number of people on the surface of the planet. Taken one at a time, any one of these charts could command the full attention of every earnest person on the face of the planet, but we need to understand that they are in fact all related and interconnected. They are all compound graphs and they are all being driven by compounding forces. To try and solve one, you would need to understand how it relates to the other ones that you see, as well as others not displayed here, because they all intersect and overlap. The fact that you live here in the presence of multiple exponential graphs relating to everything from money to population to species extinction has powerful implications for your life and the lives of those who will follow you. It deserves your very highest attention. Let's move on to an example that will help you better understand these graphs. The purpose of this mini presentation is to help you understand the power of compounding.
If something, such as a population, oil demand, a money supply, anything, steadily increases in size as a proportion of its current size, you get a graph that looks like this, a hockey stick. Said more simply, if something is increasing over time at a percentage basis, it's growing exponentially. Using an example drawn from a magnificent paper by Dr. Albert Bartlett, let me illustrate the power of compounding to you. Suppose I had a magic eyedropper and I placed a single drop of water in the middle of your left hand. The magic part is that this drop of water is going to double in size every minute. At first nothing seems to be happening, but by the end of a minute that tiny drop is now the size of two tiny drops. After another minute you now have a little pool of water that is slightly smaller in diameter than a dime sitting in your hand. After six minutes you now have a blob of water that would just fill a thimble. Now, Suppose we take our magic eyedropper to Fenway Park and right at 12 o'clock in the afternoon we place a magic drop way down there on the pitcher's mound. To make this really interesting, suppose that the park is watertight and that you are handcuffed to one of the very highest bleacher seats. My question to you is this, how long do you have to escape from the handcuffs? Days? Weeks? Months? Years? How long would that take? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. The answer is you have until 12.49 on that same day to figure out how you're going to get out of those handcuffs. In less than 50 minutes, our modest little drop of water has managed to completely fill Fenway Park. Now let me ask you this. At what time of the day would Fenway Park still be 93% empty space? And how many of you would realize the severity of your predicament? Any guesses? The answer is 12.44. If you are squirming in your bleacher seat, waiting for help to arrive, by the time the field is covered with less than five feet of water, you would now have less than five minutes left to get free. And that right there illustrates one of the key features of compound growth. The one thing that I want you to take away from all of this, with exponential functions, the action really only heats up in the last few moments. We sat in our seat for 44 minutes, nothing much seemed to be happening, and then in five minutes, bang, the whole place was full. This example is loosely based on a wonderful paper by Dr. Albert Bartlett that clearly and cleanly describes this process of compounding, which you can find in our essential reading section. Dr. Bartlett said, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is the inability to understand the exponential function. And he's absolutely right. With this understanding, you'll begin to understand the urgency I feel. There's simply not a lot of maneuvering room once you hop on the vertical portion of a compound graph. Time gets short. This makes compounding the first key concept of the crash course. Now I'm going to introduce the second key concept, and it's far enough outside of the mainstream that I'm going to get a little backup from a 19th century philosopher. Here's the quote. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. This great quote comes from this happy guy down in the corner. At some point over the next 20 years, this next concept I'm about to introduce will be self-evident. But for now, I think it would be safe to say that a lot of people would consider it to be ridiculous. And it centers around growth. Growth is good, right? We all want a growing economy, I guess. Why? Well, because a growing economy means that we're becoming more prosperous. Growth offers opportunities, and we're all for opportunities. At least I am. And this is the dominant story of our day. So many people would say that growth equals prosperity. But is this actually true? And what if it's not? Growth is actually a consequence of surplus, if we think about it. For example, our bodies only grow if they have a surplus of food. With an exact match between calories consumed and calories burned, a body neither gains nor loses weight. A pond only grows deeper if more water is flowing in than is flowing out. So it can be said that growth is actually dependent on surplus. Similarly, prosperity is dependent on surplus. Here's another example. Imagine that you are a family of four, your yearly income is $40,000, and at the end of the year, there is no money left. At the end of the year, there are zero extra dollars. But then a 10% raise comes along, which equals $4,000, and your family can either afford to have one more child, or you can enjoy additional prosperity by spending a little bit more on each person but you can't do both. There is only enough surplus money in this example to do one thing, so you have to choose. Will it be growth or will it be additional prosperity? 
And what is true in this example for a family of four is equally true for a town, a state, a country, and yes, our entire world. Through this example, we can tease out a very simple and utterly profound concept, that growth does not equal prosperity. For the past few hundred years, we've been lulled into linking the two concepts because there was always sufficient surplus energy that we could have both growth and prosperity. That is, we didn't have to make any hard choices between the two. The economist Malcolm Slessor of the Resource Use Institute of Edinburgh, Scotland, has calculated that over half of the world's energy is now used to simply grow. So here's the question. What's going to happen when 100% of our surplus money or energy is being used to simply grow? The result is going to be stagnant prosperity. And what happens if there's not enough surplus to even fund growth alone? Well, when that time comes, we will experience both negative growth and negative prosperity, not exactly the sort of future that I'm looking forward to. This, then, is the greatest challenge of our times, properly recognizing where we want our remaining surplus to go and getting that story out. I, for one, want to see continued advances in energy efficiency and medical technology and everything else that modern society can offer. This is what we place at risk if we allow ourselves to do what is easy, that is, take the path of least resistance and simply grow, instead of doing what is right which is directing our surplus towards a more prosperous future. So there it is, key concept number two, growth does not equal prosperity. Before we begin our tour through the economy, the environment, and energy, we need to share a common understanding of money. Money is something that we live with so intimately on a daily basis that it has probably escaped our close attention. Money is an essential human creation, and where all money disappear, a new form of money would spontaneously arise in its place, such as I don't know, cows, tobacco, bread, a certain type of nut husk perhaps, or even nautilus shells. Without money, the complex job specializations that we have today would not exist because barter is so cumbersome and constraining. More importantly though is the concept that each type of money system has its pros and cons. Each will enforce its own peculiar outcomes by promoting some behaviors while suppressing others. Now, if we crack open a textbook, we'll find that money should possess three characteristics. The first is that it should be a store of value. Gold and silver have filled this role perfectly because they were rare, took a lot of human energy to mine, and did not corrode or rust. By contrast, the US dollar pretty much constantly loses value over time, a feature which punishes savers and enforces the need to speculate. A second feature is that money needs to be widely accepted within a population as an intermediary within and across all economic transactions. And the third feature is that money needs to be a unit of account, meaning that the money must be divisible and each unit must be equivalent. The U.S. unit of account is the dollar. Diamonds have much value but are not good at being money because they are not perfectly equivalent to each other and dividing causes them to lose value. That is, they fail at being a unit of account. Blah, blah, blah. So what is money really? I believe it has a very simple definition. Money is a claim on human labor. With a very few minor exceptions, pretty much anything you can think of that you might spend your money on will involve human labor to bring it there. I say it's a claim on labor rather than a store of labor, because the human labor in question might have happened in the past, or it might not have happened yet. The concept of money being a claim on human labor is important, and we'll be building on it later, especially when we get to debt. As implied in the pictures earlier, literally anything can be considered money. Cows, bread, shells, tobacco. A U.S. dollar, like all modern currencies, however, is an example of a type of money called fiat money. Fiat is a Latin word meaning let it be done. And fiat money has value because a government decrees that it does. And this brings us to the key question, what exactly is a U.S. dollar? Once a dollar was backed by a known weight of silver or gold of intrinsic value. In this example, we can see the dollar came from the U.S. Treasury and was backed by a given amount of silver that was payable to the bearer upon demand. Of course, that was back in the 1930s, and those days are long gone. Now dollars are the liability of an outfit called the Federal Reserve, a private entity entrusted to manage the U.S. money supply and empowered by the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 to perform this vital function. You'll note that modern dollars have no language entitling the bearer to anything, and that's because they're no longer backed by anything tangible. Rather, the value of a dollar comes from this language right here, the fact that it is illegal to refuse to accept dollars for payment, and that Federal Reserve notes are the only acceptable form of payment for taxes. It is crucially important that a nation's money supply is carefully managed, for if it is not, the monetary unit can be destroyed by inflation. 
In fact, there are over 3,800 past examples of paper currencies that no longer exist. These are numerous examples from the United States, which may have some collector value, but no longer possess any monetary value. Of course, I could just as easily display beautiful but no longer functional examples from Argentina, Bolivia, and Colombia, and a hundred other places. How does the hyperinflationary destruction of a currency happen? Here's a relatively recent example that comes from Yugoslavia between the years 1988 and 1995. Pre-1990, the Yugoslavian dinar, seen here, had measurable value. You could actually buy something with one. However, throughout the 1980s, the Yugoslavian government ran a persistent budget deficit and printed money to make up the shortfall. By the early 1990s, the government had used up all its own hard currency reserves, and they proceeded to loot the private accounts of citizens. In order to keep things moving along, successively larger bills had to be printed, finally culminating in this stunning example, a 500 billion dinar note. At its height, inflation in Yugoslavia was running at over 37% per day, and this meant that prices were doubling every 48 hours or so. Let me see if I can make this a bit more concrete for you. Suppose that on January 1st, 2007, you had a penny, and you could find something to buy with it. At 37% per day inflation, by April 3rd, 2007, you'd need one of these, a billion dollar bill to purchase the very same item. Stated in reverse, if you had a billion dollars on January 1st stuffed in a suitcase, by April 3rd, you'd have had a penny's worth of purchasing power left. Clearly, if you'd attempted to save money during this period of time, you'd have lost it all. So we can safely state that inflationary money regimes impose a penalty on savers. The opposite side of this is that inflationary money regimes promote spending and require that money be invested or even speculated with so as to at least have the chance of keeping pace with inflation. Of course, investing and speculating involve risks, so we can broaden this statement to include the claim that inflationary money systems require the citizens living within them to subject their hard-earned savings to risk. Now that's worth pondering for a minute or two. Even more importantly, since history shows how common it is for currencies to be mismanaged, we need to keep a careful eye on the stewards of our money to make sure they are not being irresponsible by creating too much money out of thin air, and thereby destroying our savings, our culture, and institutions in the process. Wait a minute. Did I just say creating money out of thin air? Yes. Yes, I did. This is such an important process to your, our, my future, that we're going to spend the next two sections learning how money is created. If we want to have any hope of understanding all of the things that are going on in the financial world right now, we really have to start with understanding money and how it's created. So here we're going to explore the process by which money is created. Let me introduce you to John Kenneth Galbraith. He taught at Harvard University for many years and he was active in politics, serving in the administrations of Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson. He was one of a few two-time recipients of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, clearly a pretty accomplished and stand-up kind of guy. Now, about money, he famously said, the process by which money is created is so simple that the mind is repelled. We're about to discuss that very thing. If you don't get this segment the first pass, don't worry, because money creation is a truly bizarre thing to ponder, let alone accept. It's actually a very simple process, but really difficult to accept. First, let's look at how money is created by banks. Leaving aside for now where this money comes from, Suppose a person walks into town with $1,000, and luckily, a brand new bank with no deposits has just opened up. The $1,000 is deposited in the bank, and now the person has a $1,000 asset, their bank account, and the bank has a $1,000 liability, the very same bank account. Now, there's a rule on the books, a federal rule, that allows banks to loan out a proportion, a fraction of the money they have on deposit to others. In theory, banks are allowed to loan out up to 90% of what people have on deposit with them. Although, as we'll see later on, the actual proportion is much closer to 100%. Nonetheless, because banks retain only a fraction of their deposits in reserve, the term for this process is fractional reserve banking. Now back to our example. We now have a bank with $1,000 on deposit, and banks do not make money or make a living by holding on to it. Rather, they make their living by borrowing at one rate and loaning at a higher rate. Since any bank can loan out up to 90% of what they have on deposit, in our example, our bank wants to find somebody who wants to borrow $900. Suppose this borrower then spends that money by giving it to another person, in this case his uh, accountant, who in turn deposits it in a bank. Now, it could be the same bank or a different bank, but that doesn't really change how this story gets told at all. 
With this new deposit, this same bank now has a fresh $900 to work with, and so it gets busy finding somebody who wants to borrow 90% of that amount, or $810. And so another loan gets made, and it gets spent and redeposited in the bank. And 90% of this new deposit is $729, which can get loaned out. And so it goes until we finally discover that the original $1,000 deposit has mushroomed into a total of $10,000. Is this all real money? Yeah, you bet it is, especially if it's in your bank account. Now, you might also notice here that if everybody who had money at the bank, all $10,000 of them, tried to take their money out at once, the bank would not be able to pay it out because, well, they wouldn't have it. The bank would only have $1,000 hanging around in reserve, period. You might also notice that this mechanism of creating new money out of new deposits works great as long as nobody defaults on their loan. Now, if and when that happens, things get tricky and that's another story for later. For now, I want you to understand that money is loaned into existence. Conversely, when loans are paid back, money disappears. This is how money is created, and I invite you to verify this for yourself. One place would be the Federal Reserve itself, which has published a handy comic book from which I actually drew this fine example. You can find a link to that on the website under Essential Articles. You may have noticed that I left out something very important here, and that is interest. Where does the money come from to pay the interest on all the loans? If all the loans are paid back without interest, we can undo this entire string of transactions in this example. But when we factor in interest, we'd suddenly discover that there isn't enough money here in this example to pay back all the loans. Clearly, that's a big hole in the story, and so we'll need to find out where that comes from. In doing so, we'll also clear up the mystery of where the original $1,000 came from. So why did we spend the past five minutes studying the mechanism of money creation? Because in order to appreciate the implications of our massive levels of debt, you need to understand how that debt came into being. That's one reason. And the more important reason is tied to all those exponential graphs we viewed earlier in Section 3, but we're not quite there yet. Now we're going to discover where money is created. The process works like this. Suppose Congress needs more money than it has. I know, that's a stretch. Perhaps it's done something really historically foolish, like um, cutting taxes while conducting two wars at the same time. Now, Congress doesn't actually have any money, so the request for additional spending gets passed over to the Treasury Department. You may be surprised, or dismayed, or perhaps neither, to learn that the Treasury Department lives hand-to-mouth and rarely has more than a couple weeks of cash on hand, if that. So the Treasury Department, in order to raise cash, will print up a stack of Treasury bonds, which are the means by which the U.S. government borrows money. A bond has a face value, which is the amount it will be sold for, and it has a stated rate of interest that it will pay to the holder. So if you bought a bond with a $100 face value and that paid a rate of interest of 5%, then you'd pay $100 for this bond, and you'd get $105 back in a year. Treasury bonds are sold regularly in auctions, and it's safe to say that the majority of these bonds are bought by big banks, such as those of China and Japan recently. At auction, the banks purchase these bonds, and then money gets sent into the Treasury coffers, where it can be dispersed for the usual array of government programs. Now, I promised you that I'd show you how money first comes into being, and so far that hasn't happened, has it? The bonds are being bought with money that already exists in the banking system. Money is created by this next mechanism, where the Federal Reserve buys a Treasury bond from a bank. When the Fed does this, they simply transfer money in the amount of the bond to the other bank and take possession of the bond. A bond is swapped for money. Now, where did this money come from? Glad you asked. It comes out of thin air as the Fed creates money when it buys this debt. New Fed money is always exchanged for debt, and so now we can put the title on this page. All dollars are loaned into existence. Don't believe me? Here's a quote from a Federal Reserve publication entitled, Putting It Simply. When you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover the check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. Wow, now that is an extraordinary power. Whereas you or I need to work to obtain money and place it at risk to have it grow, the Federal Reserve simply prints up as much as it wishes whenever it wants and then loans it to us all via the U.S. government with interest. Given the fact that over 3,800 paper currencies and a few metallic ones have been rendered worthless due to mismanagement, 
Wouldn't it make sense to keep a very close eye on whether or not the Federal Reserve is acting responsibly with our own monetary unit? So now we know that there are two kinds of money out there. The first is bank credit, which is money that is loaned into existence, as we saw here. Bank credit is a type of money that comes with an equal and offsetting amount of debt associated with it, debt upon which interest must be paid. And the second type of money is printed out of thin air, and that's what you see right here at this stage. The process by which money is created is so simple that the mind is repelled. So don't worry if you need to review this chapter several more times. I've had some people attend my seminar four or more times, and they say that this concept is just now starting to really sink in. However, if you understood all that and get it, well, congratulations, give yourself a hand, because it's not easy. These monetary learnings allow us to formulate two more extremely important key concepts. The first is that all dollars are backed by debt. At the local bank level, all new money is loaned into existence. At the Federal Reserve level, money is simply manufactured out of thin air and then exchanged for interest-paying government debt. In both cases, the money is backed by debt, debt that pays interest. From this key concept, we can formulate a truly profound statement. At a minimum, each year, enough new money must be loaned into existence to cover the interest payments on all of the past outstanding debt. If we flip this slightly, we can say that each year, all the outstanding debt must compound by at least the rate of interest on that debt. Each and every year, it must grow by some percentage. Because our debt-based money system is growing by some percentage continually, it is an exponential system by its very design. A corollary of this is that the amount of debt in the system will always exceed the amount of money in the system. I'm not going to cast judgment on this and say that it's good or bad. It simply is what it is. By understanding its design, though, you will be better equipped to understand that the potential range of future outcomes for our economy are not limitless, but rather bounded by the rules of the system, all of which leads us to the fourth key concept, which is that perpetual expansion is a requirement of modern banking. In fact, we can make a rule. Each year, new credit or loans must be made that at least equal the amount of all the outstanding interest payments that year. Without a continuous expansion of the money supply, past debts would not be able to be serviced and defaults would ripple through and possibly destroy the system. Defaults are the Achilles heel of a debt-based money system, which we saw in our local banking example in the previous chapter. Because of this, all the institutional and political forces in our society are geared towards avoiding this outcome. So the banking system must continually expand, not necessarily because it's the right or wrong thing to do, but rather simply because that is how it was designed. It's a feature of the system, just like using gasoline is a feature of my car's engine. I might wish and hope that my car would run on straw, but I'd be wasting my time because that's just not how it was designed. By understanding the requirement for continual expansion, we will be in a better position to make informed decisions about what's likely to transpire and take meaningful actions to enhance our prospects. So the key question is this. What happens when a human-contrived money system that must expand by its very design runs headlong into the physical limits of a spherical planet. One more belief of mine is that I will witness this collision in my adult lifetime, and in fact it may have already started, and I am extremely interested to see how this is all going to turn out. Now, this is admittedly a truly gigantic proposition to consider, and some would say that it's not very interesting at all, but rather it's just frightening. Well, if you want the future to look exactly like the past, then I suppose it is frightening. But if you are flexible in your view of the future, then you have an opportunity to make the most of whatever future actually arrives. These are fascinating, invigorating, and truly unprecedented times. And I am thrilled to be living right here, right now, with you. In the next section, we'll be looking at some very important historical context about our money system, where you'll learn that our money system could be viewed as a masterpiece of sophisticated evolution or as an historically brief experiment that is not yet 37 years old. Before we move on to current events, it's vital to know how we got here. I will now present an extremely shortened version of recent U.S. monetary history. The purpose of this section is to show you that the U.S. government has radically shifted the rules during times of emergency, and that our monetary system is really a lot younger than you might think. After the panic of 1907, when private banker J.P. Morgan intervened as the lender of last resort, banks began agitating for a government solution. What was finally decided upon in 1913 was a federally sponsored cartel 
called the Federal Reserve, which sounded governmental, but really was not. The stock of the Federal Reserve was to be held by its member banks, not the U.S. government, nor the public, which remains the case today. So what we call the Federal Reserve actually is a federally sponsored banking cartel, licensed to lend money into existence. By the 1930s, a federally reserve-fueled speculative bubble had burst, resulting in numerous bank failures, which shrank the money supply by nearly a third in three years. Despite being chartered as a lender of last resort, the Federal Reserve failed to halt a catastrophic banking collapse. In 1933, newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt decided to counter the falling money supply in a most drastic manner. To accomplish this, he confiscated all privately held gold and immediately devalued the U.S. dollar. Prior to the seizure, it took approximately $21 to buy an ounce of gold, and afterwards, it took $35. Soon after, contractual obligations of the U.S. government, such as bonds payable in gold, were nullified with the approval of the Supreme Court. This goes to show how governments in a period of emergency can change rules and break their own laws. All of the seized gold either ended up in the vaults of the Federal Reserve or at the International Monetary Fund or on the books of the Federal Reserve. A grand total of $11 billion was exchanged for all 261 million ounces of the nation's gold. In other words, complete control of the gold supply of the most powerful and prosperous nation on Earth was exchanged for $11 billion printed out of thin air, creating some very serious storage hardships for the Federal Reserve. I mean, have you ever tried lifting 70-pound gold bricks that high over your head? In any event, to end the turmoil of depression and war and to provide a foundation for global recovery, A conference was held at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in 1944, with all the major Allied powers attending. Recognizing that the U.S. then represented nearly half of the global economy, the U.S. dollar was made the global reserve currency. All other currencies had fixed rates of exchange to the dollar, which in turn was redeemable for gold at $35 per ounce. The Bretton Woods II system ushered in a period of prosperity and rapid economic recovery. But there was a flaw in the system. Nothing in the Bretton Woods Agreement prevented the U.S. Federal Reserve from expanding the supply of Federal Reserve notes. As this happened, the gold backing behind each dollar steadily declined, such that there was not enough gold to back all of the dollars. Meanwhile, as the Vietnam War intensified, the U.S. was running budget deficits and flooding the world with paper dollars. The French, under President Charles de Gaulle, became suspicious that the U.S. would be unable to honor its Bretton Woods obligations to redeem their excess dollars into gold. As the French exchanged their surplus dollars for gold, the U.S. Treasury's gold stocks declined alarmingly. Finally, President Nixon declared force majeure on August 15, 1971, and slammed the gold window, ending its dollar convertibility. That's what governments do during wartime, and the U.S. followed the pattern perfectly. But this time, it affected the whole world because the removal of gold convertibility of the dollar destroyed the foundation of the Bretton Woods system. Without a gold backing, there was no hard physical limit to how many paper dollars could be issued. Since we now know that all dollars are backed by debt, what do you suppose happened to U.S. debt levels once the externally applied rigor of gold was removed? Let's find out. This is a chart of U.S. federal debt from the period of 1949 to 2004. Note that it looks like any other exponential chart we've already reviewed, but especially note that the graph turns the corner shortly after Nixon slammed the gold window. That is, when Nixon removed the last vestige of external physical restraint from the system. And also note how rapidly the debt levels have climbed recently. These past few years have seen the highest and most rapid accumulation of federal debt in our entire history, thanks in large measure to an experiment never before attempted in our country's history, the conduct of two foreign wars and a tax cut at the same time. This rapid accumulation of debt is not a mysterious process at all. Rather, it's an entirely predictable consequence of the slamming of the gold window. How much longer can this continue? Unfortunately, there's no good answer to this besides, as long as foreigners let us. A second predictable and related consequence concerns the total amount of money in circulation. Remember, all money is loaned into existence, so the shape of the federal debt chart should tip you off to the shape of this next chart of U.S. money from the years 1959 to 2007. The first thing we can note here is that it took our country over 300 years, from the very first pilgrim until 1973, to generate our first trillion dollars of money stock. Every road, every bridge, every marketplace on every corner of every town, every boat and every building, from the first colony until 1973, required a trillion dollars of money stock. 
Our most recent trillion dollars? That was created in the last four and a half months. My questions to you are these. What will it be like to live here when our nation is creating a trillion dollars every four weeks? How about every four days? What about every four hours? Four minutes? Where does this stop if not in hyperinflation and the destruction of the dollar, and by extension, our nation? If we view these events on a timeline, we can see that the Federal Reserve was formed in 1913, and that only 20 years later, in 1933, our country had entered a form of bankruptcy and had turned over its collective gold supply under force of law to the Federal Reserve. Eleven years after that, the U.S. dollar was enshrined as the world's reserve currency with an explicit backing by gold that was unilaterally removed by Nixon 27 years later. In effect, the current global monetary system of unbacked currencies is now only 37 years old. It was not planned, but simply emerged out of a crisis. The unredeemable U.S. dollar remains a popular reserve currency as a matter of convenience, but nothing requires or guarantees that it will retain this role. Only the U.S. is able to use its eroding reserve currency status to borrow and print dollars to pay for its trade deficits. However, as the dollar loses its reserve currency status from this abuse, the U.S. will be forced to either export more to pay for its imports or to take on ever heavier levels of debt. If these actions cause the dollar to keep falling, other countries will be tempted to devalue their currencies to keep pace and remain competitive. The potential for an inflationary period is evident, which brings us to the next section. We've got one more key concept in front of us, and that's inflation, and then we're going to connect a few dots at the end. Most of us think of inflation as rising prices, but that's not quite right. Imagine if an apple and an orange are a dollar each one year, but ten dollars each next year. Since you enjoy eating apples and oranges the same in one year as the next, then the only thing that's truly changed here is your money, which has declined in value. Inflation is not caused by rising prices. Rising prices are instead a symptom of inflation. Inflation is caused by the presence of too much money in relation to goods and services. What we experience are things going up in price, but in fact inflation is really the value of your money going down simply because there's too much of it around. Here's an example. Suppose you're on a life raft and somebody has an orange that they are willing to sell for money. Only one person in the raft has any money and that's a single dollar. So the orange sells for a dollar. But wait, just before it sells, you find a ten dollar bill in your pocket. Now, how much do you suppose the orange sells for? That's right, ten bucks. It's still the same orange, right? Nothing about the utility or desirability of the orange has changed from one minute to the next. Only the amount of money kicking around in the raft. So we can make this claim. Inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. And what's true within a tiny life raft is equally true across an entire nation. Here, let me illustrate this point by using a long sweep of U.S. history. What we're looking at here is a graph of price levels in the United States that begins on the left in 1665 and progresses more than 300 years to 2008 on the right. But at this moment, only inflation over the period from 1665 to 1776 is marked on this chart. On the y-axis, what is being charted are price levels, not the rate of inflation. Now you might ask, how can we compare prices in 1665 to 2008? While there are some obvious liberties that have to be taken here, what is being compared are the basics of life. People ate food in 1665, just as they did later on. People had to transport themselves. They got educations, and they lived in houses in 1665, just as they did in 1776. So what is being compared is the relative cost of living in one period to the next. That is, inflation. In 1665, the basic cost of living was set to a value of 5. Now, what is most striking about this chart to me is that from 1665 to 1776, there was absolutely no inflation. For 111 years, a dollar saved was, well, a dollar saved. Can you imagine what it would be like to live in a world where you could earn a thousand dollars, put it in a coffee can in the backyard, and your great-great-grandchildren could dig it up and enjoy the same benefits from that thousand dollars as you would have 111 years previously? This isn't some fantasy from a cheap novella. This was reality in our country at one time. The country was on a gold and silver standard during this period and advanced tremendously while enjoying near-perfect price stability during times of peace. However, along comes a war, the Revolutionary War, 
and the country found itself unable to pay for the war with the gold and silver in the treasury. So a paper currency called Continentals was printed. And at first it was fully backed by a specified amount of real gold and silver in the treasury. But then the war proved to be more expensive than thought, and more and more of these were printed. Then the British, aware of the corrosive effects of inflation on society, started counterfeiting and distributing vast amounts of bogus Continentals, and soon the currency began to collapse. Before long, massive inflation took hold. Seen on the inflation chart, the Revolutionary War took the general price level from a reading of 5 to a reading of 8. After the war, the paper Continentals were utterly rejected by the people, who strongly preferred gold and silver. Most interestingly, price levels promptly returned back to the pre-war levels. The next serious bout of inflation was also associated with the war, again due to the overprinting of paper currency, and again, upon conclusion of the war, we saw a relatively prompt return of prices to the pre-war levels, where they stayed for an additional 30 years. By now, we are nearly 200 years into this chart, and we find that the cost of living is roughly the same as it was in 1665. But then a war came along, the Civil War this time, and it was a doozy. To finance the war, the North had to resort to printing a type of currency that still lends its name to our own currency today. Of course, back then, it really did have a green back. Again, we see a rapid rise of inflation as a direct consequence of war, and again, a return to baseline after the crisis is over. We are now 250 years into this story, and the cost of living is still roughly the same as it was at the start. I invite you to think about that for a minute. But then another war came along, and this one was even bigger than any before, and again it was a highly inflationary event. And then another war, even bigger than any before it, which again proved inflationary, but this time, something odd happened. Inflation did not retreat before the next war began. Why? Two reasons. First, the country was no longer on a gold standard, but instead a fiat paper standard, administered by the Federal Reserve, and the populace did not have another form of currency to which it could turn. And second, because this was the first time that the war apparatus was not dismantled upon conclusion of hostilities. Instead, full mobilization was maintained and a protracted Cold War was fought, certainly as inflationary a conflict as any shooting war ever was. And now, if we look at the entire sweep of history, we can make an utterly obvious conclusion. All wars are inflationary. Why is this? Because any time the government engages in deficit spending, it creates the conditions for inflation. However, when the deficit spending is on legitimate infrastructure, such as roads or bridges or schools, that investment will slowly pay for itself by boosting productivity and paving the way for the creation of additional goods and services that will someday soak up the extra cash. Wars, however, are special. Vast quantities of money are spent on things that are meant to be blown up. The money stays at home while the goods get sent off to be blown up. When a bomb blows up, there's no residual benefit to the domestic economy later on. This means war spending is the most inflationary of all spending. It's a double whammy. The money stays behind working its evil magic, while the goods it produced are destroyed. Heck, even if the goods aren't blown up, there's practically zero residual economic benefit to such specialized hardware, as amazing as that technology may be. For some reason, the most recent pair of wars have been presented by the U.S. mainstream press as being relatively pain-free for the average citizen, despite overwhelming historical odds to the contrary. In fact, on this 15-year-long chart of commodity prices, we observe that prices bounced in a channel, marked by the green lines, for more than 10 years. However, and hopefully by now unsurprisingly, shortly after the start of the Iraq War, commodity prices began marching higher and have inflated nearly 140 percent in five years. Your gasoline and food bills will confirm this. So if anybody tries to tell you that you haven't sacrificed for the war, let them know you sacrificed a large portion of your savings and your paycheck to the effort. Thank you very much. At any rate, back to our main story. Here's inflation between 1665 and 1975. Knowing what you now know about Nixon's actions on August 15, 1971, what do you suppose the rest of the graph looks like between 1975 and today? This is your world. You've been living on the steeply rising portion of this graph for so long that it probably looks like level ground to you. Because inflation is now a permanent feature, and because it advances at a percentage rate, your money is declining in value exponentially. That's what this hockey stick graph is telling you. What does it mean to live in a world where your money loses value exponentially? You know what it means, because you live there. It means always having to work harder and harder, just to stay in place. 
And it means perplexing and astoundingly risky investment decisions have to be made in an attempt to grow one's savings fast enough to avoid the ravages of inflation. It means two incomes are needed where one used to suffice and kids left at home while both parents work. A world of constantly eroding money is a devilishly complicated world to navigate and leaves scant room for error, especially for those without the appropriate means or connections. And it doesn't have to be this way, and indeed for the majority of our country's history, as you can see, it wasn't. And I'm hard-pressed to say that inflation is a necessity and serves some essential and greater good because a lot of progress and advancement happened between 1665 and 1940 without the benefit of perpetual inflation. To help put all of this in context, let's mark the moments when our country abandoned the gold standard, first internally and then completely. It may have surprised some of you, as it did me, to find out that inflation is not a mysterious law of nature like gravity, but rather an extremely well-characterized matter of policy. So now we have our fifth key concept. Inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Flipped a bit, we can say that inflation is a deliberate act of policy. Here's what one wag had to say about this matter. Paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value. Zero. That was Voltaire in 1729. Of course, he was a bit too pessimistic in his assessment as this German woman proves by using her furnace to liberate the intrinsic heat content of paper money. John Maynard Keynes, the father of the branch of economics that utterly dominates our lives, had this to say about inflation. Lenin was certainly right. There is no more positive or subtle or sure means of destroying the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate, secretly and unobserved, an important part of the wealth of the citizens. The process engages all of the hidden forces of economics on the side of destruction and does it in a manner that not one man in a million can diagnose. Given that the destructive, corrosive effects of inflation are so well understood by the architects and the administrators of our monetary system, it's fair to wonder exactly what the plan here is. Now, finally, here in Chapter 10 of the Crash Course, we can string together these three very important dots. Number one, in 1971, the U.S., and by extension the world, terminated the last connection to a gold restraint and federal borrowing turned the corner never to look back. Concurrently, the money supply turned the corner, piling up at a much faster rate than the growth of goods and services. And so we get to data point number three, which is that inflation is the fully predictable outcome of data points one and two. Boom, boom, boom. One, two, three. All connected, all saying the same thing, with profound implications for your future. Now, if you're of a mind that there's no reason that all three of these graphs cannot just continue to exponentially accelerate to ever higher amounts without end, then there's no point in watching the rest of the crash course. However, if you don't happen to believe that, then you're going to want to see the rest of this. There is literally nothing more important for you to be doing right now than gaining an understanding of how these pieces fit together, assessing the risks for yourself, and taking actions to prepare for the possibility of a future that's substantially different from today. Now that we've covered compounding, money, and inflation, you have the tools to get the most from the remaining sections of the crash course. We have a few more dots to connect. During the crash course, you will often encounter numbers that are expressed in trillions. How much is a trillion? You know what? I'm not really sure myself. A trillion is a very big number, and I think it would be worth spending a couple of minutes trying to get our arms around the concept. First, a numerical review. A thousand is a one with three zeros after it. A million is a thousand times bigger than that, and it's a one with six zeros after it. At this level, I can still get my mind around the difference between these two numbers. A million dollars in the bank is a very different concept from a thousand dollars in the bank, and I can really get that. A billion, then, is a thousand times bigger than a million, and it's a one followed by nine zeros. And a trillion is a thousand times bigger than that, and it's a one followed by twelve zeros. So a trillion is a thousand billions, which means it's a million millions. Uh, you know what? I don't know what that means. I can't visualize that. So let's take a different tack on this. Suppose I gave you a thousand dollar bill and said you and a friend had to spend it all in a single evening out in the town. You'd have a pretty good time. Now suppose you had a stack of thousand dollar bills that was four inches in height. If you did, you know what? Congratulations. You are a millionaire. A stack of thousand dollar bills, four inches high, and you are a millionaire. 
Now suppose you wanted to enter the super elite of the wealthy and have a billion dollars. How tall of a stack of thousand dollar bills would that be? The answer is a stack only 358 feet high, seen here barely reaching a third of the way up the Petronas Towers. Now how about a stack of thousand dollar bills to equal a trillion dollars? How tall would that stack be? Think of an answer. Well that stack would be 67.9 miles high. And I meant stack, too. Not laid end-to-end -end or anything cheesy like that. A solid stack of $1,000 bills, 67.9 miles high. Now that's a trillion dollars. That still doesn't do it for you? Okay. I want you to imagine, then, that you're in a car on a roadway that's lined at the side with a sideways stack of $1,000 bills. A nice, compact, rectangular column of $1,000 bills is snaking along the roadside next to you as you drive the whole way. And you drive along, brrrr, without stopping, for a little more than an hour. And the entire way, there's that stack of $1,000 bills right next to you on the side of the road the whole way. Said another way, the amount of money created in the past four and a half months in our economic system, if it had been printed up as $1,000 bills and stacked along the side of the road, would stretch from Springfield, Mass. to Albany, New York. So there it is. Either you can visualize the stack better by driving along next to it, or by standing on top of it, or any other way you wish, as long as you can find a way to express this statement in a way that's meaningful for you. But make no mistake, a trillion is a very, very big number, and we should not be lulled into complacency simply because it's too big to really get our minds around. That should drive us to action instead. Keep this lesson in mind as we discuss the total accumulated debts and liabilities of the United States, which are now many trillions of dollars.